Okay, I'm set to vibrate now. <laughs> All right, so um, today we're going to talk a little bit of a review about uh, burn care. And uh, Rose had a, a good idea to uh, start the talk by reviewing one of the sicker cases that we had in uh, Trauma Bay that posed a number of problems or challenges uh, for us to deal with besides just dealing with uh, a bad burn and somebody who needed to get intubated and lined up and all that stuff. So I'll start with that and then we'll go into just our basic uh, uh, burn lecture and cover some important points uh, from, that, uh, from that lecture. So, so this is a 61 year old male and he lit himself on fire in the parking lot. And uh, he did it pretty good because he ended up having greater than 90% total body surface area burned to flame. And he comes in, for those of you who were, 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 were there, you'll remember he came in kind of just screaming and you remember what he was screaming? Let me die. So we didn't know any of that history beforehand. This is all stuff that came later in the day when the, when the wife, uh, when the wife uh, uh, came in. So EMS on scene was about uh, seven minutes. Some uh, uh, bystanders actually uh, threw some blankets uh, on him because you know, if you throw water on fuel fire, chances of it going out unless you have a lot of water are not very good. All you're gonna do is move the fuel somewhere else on the patient or, and, and it's gonna to continue to go. You gotta kind of smother those fires. So if you think of what they do for a jet fuel fire or something like that, it's all foam. It's what you spray on it and you smother, you smother the, uh, the fire. So he arrives over at UCSD about uh, 20 minutes after he, this initial incident. He's had a liter of uh, fluid and he's just literally screaming that he, he wants to die. Clearly when you go to the next picture here, you'll see why the paramedics brought him directly into the trauma room because part of our discussion will digress a little bit into the fact that eventually we had to go down and decontaminate him because the smell that we had in the trauma bay, it was, I thought, very over, overpowering. And so we opened up the doors very quickly and then all I felt I was doing was offloading the gas into the hallways and offloading it into the 2 SICU. So as we got a little further in resuscitation, we actually called environmental engineering and asked them if they could participate. And you know what the environmental engineering response time usually is. They were here instantaneously because I pretty much got on the phone and said to them, we have got a guy who's covered with diesel fuel, set himself on fire. The fumes are so bad in the Tama Bay that I'm concerned that some of the people taking care of him will be overcome with, with, uh, with the fumes. Three guys showed up like instantaneously out of nowhere. So that makes up for all the other times I asked him to fix stuff <laughs> and do things. So what we did when he uh, came in, as we talked to him, we tried to get a name, we tried to get a phone number, we tried to figure out what would happen, and he really wouldn't get off his stance of just let me die, let me die, let me die. And I have a stance for that too, and, and, and that is and unless I have family members around who can, can help me work through this, I just move forward. Because I know that if really what he wants to do is die, we can take care of that a little bit later on. When the family gets there, if they say yes, the, he, he would not want this care, he would not want this, he, we usually withdraw care, we'll turn everything off. It's just gonna delay the thing for a few hours. But what I'm not gonna do, because I was involved in this once, was make the mistake of following some guy's wish, only to find out he was psychotic on that day. And the family, you know, no, he never wanted to do that. No, if he stays on his meds, he's fine, he's productive, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as he goes off his meds because he was drinking, then he does all this stuff. So I've decided that I need more people there to help me make that decision than, than just some guy screaming at me. Albeit, it's pretty hard to listen to that, you know? And so uh, we went ahead and uh, uh, got an IV access, in, in, in a second access in him. We went ahead and intubated him. And uh, the reason I wanted to tell you about this is, let me go fast forward to a picture of his, uh, his face here, okay? And, and, and you can see that that this is going to be a tough airway, right? I mean, this is not going to be an easy thing. Why do you think it's going to be tough? What do you see in this that's uh, going to give you uh, uh, angst? 
Yeah, kind of, kind of all those things. One, you clearly know he's got an inhalation injury, right? And when the face is burned like like this, they they, ha they have they're just gonna have it. So he's got soot that's on there. He's got full thickness burns on his face, which is gonna make his face difficult to open up his mouth. All right, it's not gonna be like a nice flappy cheek. It's gonna be real tight and difficult for for uh, anesthesia to 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 do something like this. So uh, you have to think about those things. And in thinking about those things, what's gonna be our backup? So we're gonna try an tracheal tube first. We'll try an LMA if we have to, and then we're gonna go to a surgical crike. So if you look in this area underneath the, the tubing there, Surgical cry is going to be a bit of an issue too because that's third degree burn that's sitting under there. Well, the way I deal with this type of issue is I just make a very large incision through the burned tissue. And once you get down into the fat, all that problem goes away because then I can take my finger and I can find exactly where his, uh, his uh, trachea is. I can find the thyroid cartilage. I can find the cricoid membrane and it becomes very easy. So the thing to remember on somebody who's got full thickness burns on the neck is you're not going to feel where your landmarks are palpating through the skin. You got to get through the skin and then look for your landmarks. And if you do that, you'll move through pretty quickly. Where you'll get into trouble is if the surgeon's there is trying to do all this, doesn't know exactly where to go, tries to do these blind sticks through a little one inch incision and it's just not going to work for you. So you just make two, three inch inc incision. Who cares? It's coming off anyway. We're going to excise that skin, right? Sooner or later, I'm going to take all that off and because we're going to have to graft it. So difficult to uh, airway. What do you think about uh, as you're pre-oxygenating this patient? How important is it to pre-oxygenate this patient? Everyone's saying their head, why? Yes, why? Well, a number of reasons. One, he's probably got bad smoke inhalation injury. So his ability to saturate with 100% in there is going to be marginal at best. So you better really get that going and get that going early and let it go for a few minutes if you can. It's not going to be like putting you, if we put Doris on 100% bag mask right now, in about probably minute, minute and a half, she's probably saturated all her alveoli with 100%. If we do that on this guy realistically, it'd probably be five minutes or more before we would actually get that oxygen into all those areas. So spending just a little more time on 100% is important to, to, to this person because he's gonna drop like a rock when he desaturates, okay? And the other problem that you're gonna have is you already see him with the escherotomies on, but try to think about how to ventilate him without those escherotomies. And, and it's really hard to get air in. So you're there with a bag mask, you're trying to bag them, you, the chest is moving, you know, very little each time you're moving. So everything says this is going to be a bad intubation or a, a challenging in, in, intubation. And so we went, went over that and we brought the uh, glide slope in. I don't remember if we do use the glide slope to actually intubate him or we, we, we did a regular endotracheal with the laryngoscope. I think we glide slo slo sloped him, but I'm, I'm not sure. Does anyone remember how we actually got it? I think it was the glide slope, but I don't think it was difficult. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right on that. When does the airway, airway swelling begin? Like immediately or is it, is it like an hour or two? It's hours. It's, it, it's hours afterwards, okay? So what we knew as far as the A and the ABC is he's screaming at me he wants to die. I know he's got an airway, okay? So the worst mistake I can make is try to do something very quickly to get an airway and lose his airway. You know how those guys, when they come in and they've, they've, they've survived this long and then they're big, etc. you give them a little paralytic, their airway collapses and then you, now you've got a huge problem. Well, this is, this is, this guy's airway is not going to close up uh, for maybe a, about an hour realistically. After that, he's probably not going to be able to, to breathe. The edema is going to take uh, longer to develop, but his constellation of everything is going to cause him to lose his airway. And what's going to cause him to lose his airway is he's unable to get his tidal volumes until we go ahead and do the escherotomies. And we're not going to be able to do those while he's awake.
So that being said, he needs to, to get uh, two. So let me go back up uh, to, uh, to this. So he had a triple lumen catheter placed in his groin. We gave him some fentanyl. We gave him some uh, benzodiazepines. We placed an art line. And then what we noticed very quickly was that we couldn't ventilate him. And we couldn't ventilate him because the peak airway pressures alarm was going on and his tidal volumes were abysmal. I mean, his tidal volume, what do you think a tidal volume on a guy this size might be? What would we try to get? Yeah, at least 500, you know. And I think we were getting somewhere around 300 for a while, and then we went on into the 200s, and then we hit the upper 100s as we were working on him. So, now, so he's got an airway, he's breathing, he's ventilating, He's got circulation, that was never a problem. He had adequate blood pressure, he was hypertensive if I remember correctly. But now we're having problems with the ventilator. So what do we need to do? We gotta do the escherotomies. How do we do escherotomies? How do we mechanically do the escherotomy? We do the bulby, right? What does this guy smell like? See? So now we got issues. We got a room that smells like fuel, and when you want to use a piece of equipment that's going to spark, and then that whole trauma bay, that brand new trauma bay that Dr. Quimmer made for us, and you and 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 Juana made for us, is going to be black. <laughs> so we did it all by scalpel, which is something we probably rarely do. So all these were done just with the, the knife. And you can see how big they opened up already because this is uh, early on in his hospitalization. So that's just a knife blade going through there. And what we did was uh, held pressure on the small capillary bleeders, which will stop bleeding. And then we sutured up the big ones that, that we got into as we were doing that. And it took a while because I think there were four of us doing it. I think we had two MS4s. We had the ED resident doing one and I was doing one. And the surgery resident was working on, on some other things. So it took a while just to make these incisions on the chest and by doing that we can actually ventilate the guy. So what do we do at this point then? Let me go back. This is what his, uh, his uh, burn diagram looked like. You know you say well what wasn't burned? For some reason uh, the area around the way he had his boots on he had no burns on around his ankles. He had a small area of his scalp that wasn't uh, burned uh, and then tiny areas under his axilla and right up in his between his legs, the medial aspects of his proximal thighs weren't burnt, and that was it. You know, so I really, you really don't. As I'm thinking about this guy in the resuscitation phase, and my head's already thinking, how do I rebuild this guy? Where, what do we get for skin to, to work with? And if he doesn't have much skin, does he have enough to work with that we can even get cultured cells growing out of, uh, out of Boston from Genzyme? And he, and he really, kind of is pushing the line of no, 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 and, 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 and no. But this is early, and so we're waiting for his family uh, to uh, come in. So we decided to road trip him at this, at this point. And that was a first for me to move from the Trump Bay down to the decontamination center, which is where? Where do we decon people? And the ED, that little box that's kind of outside, uh, right where we used to walk over to the shack, uh, is, is where we, we do it. So having never been there before, but knowing that it was locked, I figured out I should call somebody in the ED and ask them how to do that. And they were great because I told them what we needed to do, told them the problems that we were going to probably have doing this, and they gave us uh, ED tech to set everything up and stay with us the, the whole time and show us where everything was. So you're thinking ahead, what types of problems, what do you have to anticipate for this road trip? Because this is a little different than CT scan. So what, what do we need for, for this road trip? We need to have our ventilator. We need to have our IV fluids, all our pumps. We need to have a whole bunch of drugs because none of us know how long this is going to take. And once we're out there, we probably can't have any access to drugs. And I'm, I'm sure we could have a runner run the drugs down from the trauma bay, but we're pretty much on our own out there. And what else do we need? A lot of people, okay? Because A, we gotta critically care manage this guy outside in this little shack. And, and then B, we've got all that equipment that we're gonna drag out with us, then we almost needed somebody just to take care of the equipment. Because what happened is we got outside. What happened, Ann? Remember? Well, we ended, up, we ended up putting the ventilator out one door and the IV pumps out the other. 
had yeah, so we, so we had, had issues with getting up the ramps, pull, pushing all the yellow. And then how about, how about power? Oh, that's true too, yeah. All right, so everything we moved is on battery, right? And of course, as we get out there, now we have to find a place to, uh, to plug in because the batteries weren't, weren't la la lasting. And so we're going to plug in all of our equipment in an area where we're going to be using a lot of water. So that's the reason why we left all the equipment kind of out the door and had the lines running into the area because once we started washing them, it was like washing your little kids in the tub. You know, there was just, everybody was wet and there was water everywhere. So we had problems with, you know, well not problems, but we had to get electricity. We had to make sure we didn't put ourselves in, 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 in danger. Then we had to physically do this. So we had somebody on airway the whole time as we rolled the guy from side to side and three or four of us were, were just spraying him down and washing him with lots and lots of soap to try and get this the, the stuff off him and then uh, we had a couple people that were just standing there holding blankets so people couldn't look in while we were doing this because we kind of extended out both ends of the, the little hut and uh, the fire rescue people were sitting in their trucks just staring at us in dis <laughs> utter disbelief and I think somebody said to, to when the, one of the guys came up and asked him what they were doing, he said he's got lice. So <laughs> I thought that at least there was some humor still with us. But we did that and then we, you know, dried him off as best we could and then we, we, we made the trudge uh, upstairs. But uh, I remember calling, uh, I don't remember Nan who came in to help us in the trauma bay, but I know I called Janine down and Janine said to me, are you really sure you want to do this? Because she hadn't done it either. She goes, I don't know how this will work. And I said, well, no, but I don't want to take them upstairs like this. I don't think we should keep exposing people to this because something bad could happen. I might have forgotten and pulled the bovie out and then we all would have been crispy critters. I think it worked better than I anticipated. I think, I mean, it, I think it you know, it took a lot of people and a lot of equipment, but I think the process went better than. Yeah. Did the fuel get inside when you did the escarotomies, though? Because you couldn't really take it off very well? Did you? It probably did to a small extent. Was to a small extent. Was burnt, was it? You mentioned it was all. I, I think there had to have been a lot of re residual scene because it was you could really f smell this coming off this guy because we I first thought that just getting his clothes off what was left of them and getting him and tie him up in the in the back because I gave him to whoever was there Vince or Ron is to get rid of these and, and the room just didn't get much better then I began to wonder whether he had uh, absorbed a lot of this and he was offloading it from his 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 lungs but figured that probably wasn't happening because he probably didn't stay with the stuff on him for a long period of time, probably lit himself up right away. So I feel comfortable doing it again. I think this is why Rose asked us to present this because this is one of the more interesting aspects of the thing of, 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 of figuring out how to do this and then making sure that it, that it works. And you gotta just kind of plan every part of the thing uh, uh, ahead of time and I, I think the easiest way for me to think about it is like what if we took somebody to CT scan and for some reason we got stuck down there doing more and more scans what things would we need what things would we normally run out that we would be asking somebody to run upstairs and get well we had to figure those out and just take them downstairs so we had a bunch of drugs the only thing in retrospect would be you know maybe a spare pump or something like that or a spare battery for the pump uh, in, in retrospect but I think it's doable we actually kept him reasonably warm by the time we got upstairs. He wasn't too cool. And so I think it's a doable thing. So I, I, I think it's just something to think about. And the, I think the other key thing is you need someone from the ED to make it happen. You know, you need to have somebody call down there and say, you know, this is what we want to do. Uh, can you help us do that? And get somebody to say yes, and I'm going to sign this person to you, and they will take you through the whole thing. And they did. They were great about it. And I don't know if it requires an attending, attending call or a head nurse, a head nurse, but you need to get, get somebody who's going to make it happen for you. They were just waiting for us. Okay, so uh, he was taken upstairs then. I showed you his burn chart. And um, you can see he has uh, the burns uh, everywhere. You can kind of see where they're not burned quite as badly. We did escherotomies uh, everywhere on this fellow. We did upper extremity escherotomies, finger escherotomies, hand escherotomies, lower extremity escherotomies, and feet escherotomies. And it was a few hours before we finally got a hold of his wife, and, and she got over there and then filled us in with that, with, uh, with that, uh, with that story. And you can see, remember I talk about people with electrical injuries? 
then we talk about whether an injury is bad or whether it's not bad. And one of the things to tell if it's real bad is if the hand's in a clutch position. So while this is not an electrical injury, it's the same thing. The reason that your hands, your elbows, your knees will go into flexion either from an electrical injury that's affected your muscles or from a burn is because those are the muscles that are the strongest in, 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 your, in your extremities. And when you see that and when you try to push them and there's resistance and they keep going back into there, it tells you that the muscle's been involved. And so you know that this is a fourth degree burn that's in this, that this, this, this patient has in, 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 in his arms. And you can see back here, you, whereas you see a little bit of redness in it, this is bad redness. This, these, this is co these are capillaries that have, uh, that are very fragile capillaries that essentially have broken. And you kind of see that redness that's kind of stuck in there. Um, the next day, this will all be white as white could be. All right, this is just on its way to, to, to de 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 declaring itself. We continue to have problems, or we had problems then later in the day uh, with ventilation again. And so rather than just staying with the escherotomies that look like mantle escherotomies, it looks like the big breastplate that old Romans used to put on them, one on the front, one on the back. We go ahead and we start making these, these hatch marks. And remember, these hatch marks are made by the bovi, and the bovi is only a couple millimeters wide. But you see how far they've separated. And by the morning, we actually had to take the bovi and we took all those pieces off. So we were essentially looking at just his, his uh, abdominal wall. Each time you buy a little more uh, uh, in pressure because he met the thoracic compartment syndrome di diagnosis and he met abdominal compartment syndrome uh, diagnosis. And uh, the next step after that is, of course, to open up his abdomen and put the, the Bogata bag on there and let his um, small bowel come out and that will give him even more um, uh, room. But we were able to do it just by doing what we do. You can see the escherotomies on his, uh, his, his, his lower extremities also. And then he's covered with, uh, with uh, silvidine and, and that's how we manage it. This was what we did the next morning. This is how you just kind of take each one of those pieces off. And there's a little bit of fat left and what's under there is, uh, is the fascia, the anterior, uh, anterior, anterior fascia. So like when you're in the trauma bay and you're wondering well, someone's got a stab wound to the abdomen and the question is, is the fascia penetrated? This area down here, the kind of lighter aspect of it is the, was what we're always concerned about. So we removed that completely on him. Uh, to try and uh, combat the uh, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. And there you can see there's the white of the, of the fascia and he's completely um, taken, taken off. And this took care of the problem with both the pulmonary component and the cardiovascular component and allowed his kidneys to make, uh, make, make, make urine uh, uh, once, uh, once again. And this is just some pictures looking at the uh, escherotomies that are on the, the patient's arm and the, and the patient's uh, hands. So. What we did was um, uh, complete that. Uh, we supported him overnight. Family had come in a couple hours after he was here. They kind of absorbed all of it and told me, no, there's no way that he would have wanted to have killed himself. Something must have caused him to kind of flip out and, and, and do this. And I told him that his prognosis was, you know, extremely grave. Uh, and, and that we probably wouldn't be able to, to help him, but we would keep him going overnight and we could reconvene in the morning. And then by that time in the morning, we, we had gone through doing the further escherotomies uh, and I realized that we really didn't have any donor sites to speak of and, and this was a fatal injury. And so I kind of just sat there and listened to the wife and daughter. Turns out the daughter's husband was a pediatrician and. They're just talking to me and I'm listening to them and they finally said, you know, I, I don't think he'd like to live like this. And so I let them kind of vocalize that and then I came back and said, I don't think he can live with this. Okay, I think your decision is fine. Uh, I agree with it 100%, but I want you to know that I don't want you to feel the burden of this because I don't think this is a survivable injury. And so I'm going to make that decision with your uh, approval to just withdraw cure on him later today. And uh, they kind of all just sit back and take a sigh of relief uh, since I told them that we would be the people doing that, not them. And that's what we did later in the, later in the day. So the interesting thing about it is uh, 
he had a history of uh, early uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, he had expressed an interest in trying to support some Parkinson's research with some of the funds that he thought he was going to get. And so the, my wife uh, and the pediatrician asked me, um, so is there any way we can give his brain to the Parkinson's somewhere so they can do research? And then I gotta say that kind of floored me because I'd never even thought about something like that. Working in the tissue bank, I know we do bank brains uh, and uh, we bank brains for concussion and we bank brains for other things. So I figured there's gotta be somebody who wants that. As it turns out, they wanted uh, brains up at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, so uh, we made an arrangement uh, for that to happen after his death uh, so that uh, stuff was uh, sent up there. So it, it was a case that kept on, uh, kept on, uh, on, on, on giving. Let me, then, let me then go really, um, not even really quickly, let me just find some slides that I want to show you some, some information about here. I think this is an important one because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Make sure in your house you have a smoke detector and now it's required by law to have a carbon monoxide detector because this is where most of our burn fatalities come from. They come from house fires. They happen daytime or nighttime? Nighttime. Nighttime, right? They happen when you're sleeping. Carbon monoxide, what does that smell like? We talked about what diesel fuel smells like and gas smells like. What's carbon monoxide? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, the reason you smell stuff coming out of your back pipe of your car is you're smelling the other hydrocarbons that are giving off a smell. If we just put straight carbon monoxide in a hose and put it in front of you, you won't smell that at all. Same with propane. Propane does not have a smell. The smell is added to the propane so you know that there's a propane, a propane leak. Okay, so make sure you have your smoke detectors. If you have a young family, make sure that the kids know where to go in the event of a fire. Because like in that fire, they, the family could not go where they normally would go. Tell them where to, to huddle, uh, etc. And where to meet once they get out of the place. So have a plan. Have an evacuation plan. This is the worst type of fire I think you can get into because the car is designed not to burn. So everything in the car is flame retardant or flame resistant. So when you get burned inside of a car because of your car crash, A, you're either unconscious or B, you're trapped. So when that car is burning, you're in a really hot fire. And some of the worst third and fourth degree people burns that I've seen have come out of these things. And, and this is almost like you're baked. Not like you're burned, it's like you're baked. It's so hot in those things. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is the temperature of your water. This is the time it takes to get a deep second degree burn or third degree burn, okay? So in the county, the law is that you should be set in your uh, thermostat on your hot water heater about 122 degrees if you're renting the house or if you have an apartment or if you're in a hotel. They can't regulate what you have in your own house, okay? But if you go to Home Depot and you buy a brand new uh, water heater, it will start low and it will go to high. High will only go to 156 degrees. That's why the slide's set like that. And low is all the way down to the upper 90s. So it lets you get to about 122 degrees. 122 degrees takes three minutes to go ahead and get a burn from that. You can see as you just start cranking that up just a little bit, if we go to 133 degrees, about 10 degrees more, it's only 15 seconds. And if you hit 140 degrees, it's only five seconds. You say, well, I'm pretty quick. I can put my toe in there and figure out it's hot. Great, but how about the person with a diabetic neuropathy? How about the elderly person whose nerves are not so good so they can't quite feel it? So you put those people into even 133 degrees and by the time they figure out that it's hot and they now try to get themselves out of the bathtub, they got a bad burn. And that's what we see over and over and over again. And so when they go to their faucet and they fill their little bucket of water just to clean their feet in, and they come in with second and third degree burns of the feet, it's because they can't feel what's going on. So this is why it's set to, to be down here. And that's usually like one notch, at most two notches up on your hot water heater. Your hot water heater doesn't say how many degrees. It just says low, medium, and kind of high. A lot of people will put it at high if you have a big house 
and you want to get the hot water all the way out to the back bedroom or the back uh, back shower and stuff like that just remember everybody at the front of the house is seeing 156 degrees while you're maybe seeing 120 130 degrees out there so this is the problem that you that that that, that you run into when you see that come in you leave that on okay in the trauma bay there's no reason in the world to take the tar off the thing you need to make sure is that tar is not hot anymore if it's hot you got to cool them down rarely do they show up and the tar is still hot because the people on the work site know enough to pour cold water on this so they will take their jugs of cold water that they use for drinking and they will dump it on the patient they will find a hose somewhere they will hose the patient down and usually by the time you see them this is just a caked piece of Tar that's, that's, that's on them. It will take us two days to get this tar off them. It comes off with any oil based, petroleum based, anything. We use goop from Home Depot, uh, but you can, can use mineral oil to try and put on this. So as long as it's not around the face and airway issue and eye issue, just leave the stuff alone and, and we'll get it off later. This is actually a, a, a very sterile environment underneath here because it's burned all the bacteria that's been on their skin. How bad the burn is with this depends on where they were injured. So I need to know from the patient what they were doing. If they were right by the tar trailer, and they were just pouring it into their bucket. This is probably coming out about six to eight hundred degrees. That's going to be all full thickness burns under there. They're actually mopping it up on the roof. It's probably between two and three hundred degrees. So they've got a chance that it's not all full thickness because a lot of these people will have burns that will actually heal without surgery with this type of thing. And the typical story is it's the person that's up mopping, slips, falls onto the roof. So it's not like the the bucket that he or she has is two to three hundred degrees. They've already spread it out and it's starting to dry off on the on the roof and, and cool off. So it's not as bad as you as you as you think it is. Um, this is survivability. You had asked me this question before. I'd call your attention only to the two on the right and the one on the left. This is the 50% cutoff range in which 50% of the patients will live or die, depending if your water glass is half full or half empty. Sandy, mine's half empty right now. <laughs> I know you're a half full type person. But the important thing here is categories two and three, which is our ages three through 40, you can have a TBSA that's about 65% of your body and half of the people will, will live. But if you take an older person that's uh, 70 or greater, and I think the age is not the thing, it's their physiology. You know there are some 40 and 50 year olds that look like they're 70 year olds or have so many coronary disease. So I think the real thing here is the sicker your patient is coming in, it's only about a 23% TBSA in which half the patients will live and half the patients will die. And they'll die from an exacerbation of their underlying disease, the coronary artery disease, their COPD, they'll get a pneumonia and they won't come back from that. So while we've made great strides in this part of the curve, this part of the curve just kind of sticks down there. In the last 30 years, we've only moved this from about a 10% burn out to about a 23% burn with all the critical care and all the other stuff we can offer these patients, they still don't do very well. Point being for you in the trauma bay, something that's a smaller burn, you know, 25% TBSA on a 78 year old patient, that's a bad burn for that patient, okay? Whereas 25% burn on any of you guys coming in there, that's gonna be a pretty easy thing to take care of. It's gonna be pain, et cetera, to take care of in the trauma bay. Older person, it's badness. Let me just go through real quickly here. So sunburn is, is, your, is your model of your first degree burn, but all sunburn is not first degree, right? If you've got blisters from the sun, it's a second degree burn. And that happens all the time if you're out there long enough. Here is a, a pull down scald. And I, I put this on here because this is the typical look of an unintentional burn injury to a child. Unintentional scald injuries look like this. The arm is usually up, pulling something off a counter, off the tabletop, so the arm is burned. The face very quickly looks away, so it's the side of the face, and it's the side of the face that would be hit that's looking away from the thing, and either goes down mostly the anterior torso and sometimes goes on the posterior torso. That is not the look of an intentional injury. Intentional injury has a look of being dipped, sat in, pushed in, held in, okay? Stocking glove types of, of appearance to those, uh, give those uh, 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 away. This is a burn of a child, uh, older child, 
who put their hand up against a hot oven. You can't tell what this is right now uh, as far as the depth of burn. You know it's at least a second degree burn, right? It's all blistered up. You don't know if it's a partial thickness or, or deep, I'm sorry, a superficial or a deep partial thickness burn. So later on I'll show you I've got that uh, removed, but remember what that one looks like. This is your deeper partial thickness burn. Uh, it's got a little bit of silvadine. Bottom line, it's kind of dry. It, it's, it's more pale looking. This is a typical uh, kid in a high chair. Uh, soup, or oh, it's usually soup is what they have. So they're sitting in their high chair. They're kind of strapped in there. They got the little thing for their little table. And they've got their soup and it's too hot. And, and you say, well, why would anybody put it on there when it's too hot? It's, it's probably not too hot to get in your mouth. But if you were like to stick your hand in there, you probably couldn't hold it in there for a long time. So what happens is the kid spills it, spills it into the diaper, and then it's, it's just held up against them and it gets time. So whether or not you get a burn depends not only the temperature of the stuff you come in contact with, it's how long you're in contact with it, right? So if I'm in contact with something that's hot, which happens with the flash burns, the arc burns, you know, I'm an electrician, I'm working on this thing over here, it explodes, it doesn't really explode, it just, it, everything that's in the air rarefies and you get a nanosecond exposure to something that's about a thousand degrees temperature, okay? So you get a burn from that versus this is something that's probably, you know, 150 degrees, 120 degrees edible if you blow on it. Uh, but if you drop it in your diaper and you sit in it, it's going to be a bad thing. This actually healed uh, by, uh, by uh, conservative uh, measures. Another little kid put her hand up onto the iron. Now, look at that blister. Doesn't that blister look different than the other one you saw? You can tell that underneath here, this is probably going to be white. This is another kid that put her hand onto an iron. Do you think this is an intentional injury or an unintentional injury? Intentional. Well, I heard both there. So, why do you think it's intentional? What do you see? Nobody's going to touch an iron, you pull your hand away, right? Right. You've got to hold your whole hand on there, and that looks like a worse injury. So, you're all saying the right thing, but there's one key that you're missing. If you go up and touch, if I'm two years old and I don't know that the back of this iron is hot and I just happen to put my hand on it, usually my hand's in some degree of flexion. It's not like flat out when I touch anything. So you get this imprint of, of that. Put the palm on it, put the fingertips on it. Versus when I'm mad at you and I'm going to put your hand on that thing and I press you like I want to brand you. And then the whole fingertips, the palm. It, the whole hand looks like it's been burned. So you know like when you go to a children's hospital and you see those hand prints on the walls? That would be in it the look of an intentional injury versus this which actually is more of a look of an unintentional injury, but a real hot iron, okay? So just some little things that you, you, you kind of learn and actually written about a little bit. This is a third degree flame burn. We live in a Navy town. Not everything that's third degree looks like this. If you come out of a steam uh, burn, which could be either in the engine compartment of a Navy ship, or you could come out of uh, some of the plumbers that are working in the steam areas. Uh, you know, if you go up to UC, everything's run on steam underground. That's how they get their heat. That's how they heat their water. A lot of factories are still run on steam. So they'll be down there fixing something and then a pipe breaks and then they're caught down there. They, what color do you think they look like? White. White, exactly. So if you cook a lobster, you know the colors that the lobster goes through as you cook it. If you don't cook it enough, it's still nice and pink and real pink. And then the longer you cook it, the whiter it gets until it's like a piece of rubber. Okay. Yeah, lobster. So what do you think happened to this boy? This is uh, around a 12 or 14 year old boy. What happened to him? Put on your CSI cap and tell me what happened. Something splashed on him. Okay, I'm a 14 year old boy. I'm with another 14 year old boy. What are we messing around with? Gasoline. And why are we messing around with gasoline? Well, that would be the smart thing. Yeah. Little boys like to have fires. And they, you know, if they have a little fire, a little campfire in their backyard or in their mom and dad's uh, um, little 
thing you have in the backyard fire pit, it's always got to be bigger. It's just not good enough to have a fire, it's always got to be bigger. And so this guy is on, uh, here's the little fire pit. He's over there, and I'm over here, and the two of us get the brainy idea to put an accelerant on it, so we're going to put gasoline on there. So we go and get gasoline and put it in a pail, and we throw the gasoline onto the fire. And my aim was not too well. And as it came through the fire and landed on the guy, it's now, uh, it's now lit up. So it's like a little flamethrower. So this is about two days out uh, uh, injury. And this is the pseudo eshar And it's called pseudo eshar because it's made of white cells and dead tissue, tissue debris, as opposed to an eshar, which is made of white cells and uh, platelets. That's how you stop the bleeding. And this is the third degree burn that he has from uh, dealing, dealing with that. You guys know all about burn shock blah blah blah. One thing on the kids is just remember we make the general statement that children under the age of two years should have a maintenance IV that contains dextrose in it. We do that because the kids brains work on dextrose. That's the preferential source of fuel that the brain likes to work on. In reality it's probably only one-year-olds and less but there is a small group that's you know outside the bell-shaped curve and that's why we just say up to two years of age you should have a maintenance IV that has D5 half or D5 normal saline and then we'll resuscitate them in a second line with just lactated ringers and that way we don't have to worry about some of the longer term developmental problems that can get develop when the kids aren't getting enough glucose. So if the kid does not make it into Cal Berkeley or Yale, it's not my problem and your problem that they didn't get in there. They just didn't have the right stuff, okay? Uh, interosseous stuff, we don't see these that much because you know the, the interosseous gun is more prevalent in the uh, EDs and so we see more of those uh, coming in. But if you see one of these come in, your goal should be to help us get an IV established so we can take that thing out. Because that's nothing but trouble waiting to, to happen. So what type of trouble can happen to a little kid with this in there? Um, could, but, but it doesn't. Infection is a big one. Infiltration is the biggest problem these kids can have. So this one is actually put in the correct spot. This is the medial aspect I'm thinking of. I think this is the left leg. And so you want to place this two finger breasts below the tibial tuberosity slightly onto the medial side of your leg. And if you feel that portion of your leg, your tibia should be right very close to the skin. If you go to the lateral side of that, there's a piece of muscle that's in front of the tibia. That's your anterior compartment. Sometimes the kids will come in and they put it on that side and that's in the anterior compartment. What happens if the anterior compartment develops compartment syndrome? Foot drop. We all know that one, right? That's the one where the guy comes in and does, 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 does that thing. So if you put this on the wrong side, and you infiltrate, you've got a big problem very quickly. Because in a little kid's compartment is probably only this big. Probably holds less than 100 mLs of fluid in it with no muscle, with the muscle scooped out. So you put 50 mLs on into a little kid who's already crying. You're not going to even know there's more problem going on. And you run into trouble. So get the thing out right away. Okay? Get, 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 make us get IV access. If you can't get it, make, let, make us get a central line in the low squirt and let's, let's, let's go. So let me just keep going. So this is, we already talked a little bit about smoke inhalation. What are the risks to having smoke inhalation? You can be in a closed space environment. That's the biggest risk for you. So you're in your house, you're in your apartment, you're in your car. You rarely see people with smoke inhalation who are out uh, in their backyard. We will see those with the firestorms, but the type of smoke inhalation we see is particulate matter, reactive airway, asthma, exacerbation, yada yada. Smoke inhalations cause three pathophysiologic mechanisms, right? Particulate matter, heat, and toxic byproducts of combustion. We've already talked about two of those. Actually, we've talked about all three already. Two ladies that came in, toxic byproducts of combustion plus heat. Particulate matter, just, just kind of wheezing and asthma. And this is just some of the stuff that you see. This is just some mucoid plugs. This is just some of the hyperemia that you see that's, that, that's in there. I, I, I've got to add my newer ones that just have just black soot, uh, soot in there. I just want to go to a couple pictures here at the end. I think I have.
Yeah. Okay, so this is a little guy, and I'll finish with it, these few pictures. This little guy was out raking leaves with his dad, and then they were bur put him in a pile, and then they were burning him. And his, his uh, uh, shirt caught fire. You can see this is the belt line of his pants over here. You can look at this, and you can say, oh, well, what type of, what degree burn do you think that that is? Second degree, partial thickness, deep or superficial? This is a deep parcel or third degree burn. Around the periphery, you see a little bit of pink there. That might make you want to say that this is a parcel thickness burn. But in the middle here, you kind of see that it's much, 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 much lighter. Look what it looks like a, a, a couple of days later. Now this is clear that this is all a full thickness, uh, a full thickness burn that this little guy has. And this is him with, uh, with his uh, skin grafts on. This patch of skin graft goes all the way up to here. I put some allograft over it just because I wasn't sure he would stay in his splint. And if he did a bunch of this, I didn't want him to shear it out of his out, uh, underneath his axilla there. And he did fine. And then we take the allograft off at day, uh, at day five. This guy came through the trauma bay uh, in 2005. I remember this because I was just getting ready to cook a barbecue at my house when you guys called me about this one. So that's why I like to show it. So he's about a 70 to 75% structure fire. TBSA. The reason for this picture is this is after he's kind of all cleaned up upstairs. This is day one. And this is what he looks like 48 hours later. Okay? That's why you've got to have your airways established early on in these patients. That's why you've got to have these things secured. So if you float up, you just need, and you see somebody like this, you need to make sure that all the ties are, are on. And this is actually a bad example because we, by our own protocol, request that we have two ties, one tie that goes from the ET tube up over the ears and one that goes under the ears. So as the swelling goes up, you've got to loosen the ties. And as the swelling goes down, you've got to kind of tighten the ties back, back down so that ET tube stays in, stays in place. But that just gives you an idea of, of what just fluid does. Again, you see that he's got some uh, area of redness uh, around there uh, and a very pale in the middle. So you might want to say, well, this is a deep partial thickness uh, burn, uh, but he fools you. And you look at it, it's all this white stuff a couple of days later, and this is all full thickness burn. And you can see he's got his escherotomies. He developed thoracic and abdominal compartment syndrome too, uh, but he was taken care of just uh, by that. This is a simple burn that's on his leg. This burn by itself should be a partial thickness burn. It might even heal on its own. But in the face of a big burn with all the cytokines being released and perfusion abnormalities, even those go bad and actually need to be excised. So just what you see in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a bigger burn. So you see this on day one. You see some orange and pink over there. You go, well, maybe some of this is going to heal. No, life is just cruel. All this stuff is full thickness. So here, you see that back. It's got some pink in it. It's, it's all gone a couple days later. Um, this was that uh, kid. This was that big uh, boy that you had way, way, way back up there. So kind of white-ish looking in here. So deeper partial thickness here. Uh, more superficial partial thickness here. It, it all healed with uh, conservative uh, measures. This is a little uh, boy who was in his crib and uh, they had a uh, light uh, on top of the dresser next to the crib and they had drapes behind the light there was a window and the light bulb caught the drapes on fire so something must have happened or the drape got in by the light bulb and caught a fire and the parents went into the room with the drapes on fire and the kid into the crib these are very uh, deep partial thickness burns that we were able to get to, to heal uh, without uh, surgery on this uh, little, little squirt. But you can see how a couple of days later it looks whiter in there than it did uh, when, he, when he first uh, came in. And this is him just uh, recovering. But he actually did recover and went uh, back uh, home. This is a little kid who had firecrackers in his pockets. He had poppers, the things that you throw on the ground and they explode. He was in the back seat of his SUV with his mom and dad in the front seat, uh, listening to the radio, kind of bebopping, and the, he, he set them off. So he has these full thickness burns in the perineum here, uh, as well as laterally here, 
these the ice pans caught on fire that required us to uh, to uh, to graft them. This is an early picture of the graft. Doesn't look real good because some of the graft failed over there. But the little guy actually did fine, and we kept uh, following him to make sure that his uh, sexual function was working. And last check, he still was able to get an erection. So I felt I did everything I could do for the kid. And now he has to get smarter. Uh, and I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's all that I wanted to just show you. So uh, I was bragging about you guys over at the uh, uh, some people we were talking about with Radies how adept we are in dealing with kids, and they said, "Well, it's strange. Most places aren't like that." I said, "Well, you know, after the initial panic of there's a 13-month coming old and." We got to deal with them, blah, blah, blah. Once they get the Breslow tape out, they're usually pretty, pretty much right on target. And then I usually get a frantic page for me or Greenberg or Jeannie to come down right away because the kid's here. So I told them you guys do a, a, a good job. And then I also told them, and of course, we transfer the patient as soon as it's, it's safe to do, to do so to your institution. And so they kind of like that. So thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, chat with you today. Um, I think I just wanted to bring up that one case because it's an interesting case that brings up a problem that happens. It's never happened to me in the 11 years that I've been here. Um, it probably won't happen for 11 more years, but it's just something to think about and a little bit of a review and burn. So thanks a lot. <laughs>